welcome. Uh, thanks for being here. It's the last panel of the day, which I know is always, it's always tricky, but hopefully we're going to try and keep you very much awake. And uh, one strain that's been running through, I think, all the conversations here is what do you do when democratic institutions and elections produce anti-democratic results? And we seem to be seeing this more and more in uh, Western democracies, and uh, I would argue we've certainly been seeing it in the United States um, in, a, in a way that has left me the most pessimistic I've ever felt in my lifetime about uh, the future of American institutions. So I wanted to start with this group uh, to talk about this and, and what, what we do when the democracy we have doesn't produce the kind of results that we want. And so, Carol, let me start with you and, and we'll hopefully have a conversation and then we'll leave a few minutes for questions at the end. I think one of the first things that we have to recognize, and I'm going to talk about the American context, is that you have the rise of what we call voter suppression laws. And these laws were targeted at key elements in the population to ensure that they would have multiple obstacles to have to jump over. And then what we do is we blame those groups for not voting. And, and instead of looking at those obstacles that look race neutral, but that they are racially targeted. And so what we have to do is to dismantle the barriers to voting. Because when you look at the polls, part of what you see is you see a population that, that thirst for democracy, that is hungry for democracy, but you have a structure that is anti-democratic. Um, and so we have to mobilize in order to remove those barriers to democracy. Um, there's so many things to say about this. I, I do believe that the forces of a, a very binary political system forces us into a winner take all sort of you win, I lose, zero sum game kind of politics that is dangerous for democracy because ultimately you end up in a pitched battle for I will do anything that it takes to win. Um, and that's kind of where we are in the United States. And I think one, uh, both parties play this to some extent. I think one party for them, voter suppression is a, a political strategy. Um, and when that's your political strategy, you're not in a democracy at all anymore. And so we are slipping into a place where I think uh, democracy and democracy as culture, as Achilles pointed out, is what's at stake here. People don't understand the concept of democracy when the game we're playing is to actually rob the other of their agency and their rights. And that's what we're doing. Could I take us to a little bit of the light? Because there's so much darkness to talk about this, and I'm refusing to be pessimistic because one, I love that spirit. Well, one is if you're optimist, you're only disappointed once. When you're pessimist, you're disappointed when you choose to be pessimist and then when the bad thing happens. So, <laughs> and I think it's kind of trendy now to be pessimistic about democracy and climate. And I think those two things are going together. And we have to, we have to really fight that trend in a really big way for ourselves. What I do see the light is, um, we just got done doing a report mapping the 420 organizations shaping 21st century politicians. And in the United States, there is a flood of political entrepreneurship going on to do this work. And, and as Carol will probably talk about more, it is, as we were talking about before, it is diverse, it is interesting. I'll give you one example that could be just a, a, a light. Um, there's a, about 560,000 elected positions in the United States, is a lot. There's 6.1 million in the world, so we have 560,000. Um, if the Native Americans are going to achieve parity for how much they represent the country, and by the way, most Native Americans live in states that have been problematic for democracy, you can say that again, they would need 17,000 elected officials, and there are 200 Native Americans elected. Sounds bad, but there's opportunity here. I mean, magical opportunity, and incredible entrepreneurs are on the ground organizing, changing the laws so you don't, because one of the things in the, in the reservations is you do not have an address, and you have to have an address to register to vote. So this is proactive, systematic, empowering people versus just playing defense. And what I, that, that makes me really happy, and my concern is I just got back in the US speaking to about 20 of these entrepreneurs, including a new movement called Country First, which is a, not a red movement, but a blue movement, but a purple movement. This is Adam Kissinger, who stood up as a Republican during the January 6th committee and lost his seat, which you see Liz Cheney and many others. 
and they are mobilizing. They have so much money in mobilizing. Uh, honestly, independent and Republicans who don't want democracy to go this way to run candidates against election deniers in important states. So there is massive, massive opportunity, and we need to shine a light and feed the good wolf in us. Mm -hmm. I will leave you, though, with a concern I have, is that it is not enough to play status quo politics anymore. We all know that. We're here talking about new ways of doing things. And the, the um, scarcity on the minds of Americans and American even political entrepreneurs, we're just like scraping to win instead of thinking what sort of politics do we want, what does that future look like, that is being um, short-sighted, and, and I understand why we're playing. But So we're not expanding the experiments we have with ranked choice voting that has changed. We're not really leaning into the possibility. So I hope as we, we have this big election in two years and in, in, in a couple months, we have them all the time at the local level. We've got to hold that uh, optimism and stretch into new ways of the future at the same time while defending and improving our democracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting you're talking about kind of this having the long and short view at, yes. the same, at the same time. And one of the things that is credited with the Republican Party having been out of power for many years is that they, they really worked on a very local grassroots level to build support and take over local uh, elections, which can be very crucial, as we were talking about before. In fact, the, the race that really kind of decided this election between Trump and Biden was was dependent in some degree on, on one Republican official in yes. Georgia who, <laughs> who had the guts to uh, resist pressure from the White House. But just as you're talking about playing that long game, the Republicans are too, and now they're going after secretaries of state. So, you know, what do you do? If you say we, you know, we can't wait 40 years. Well, you know, part of it is that you make really clear to the electorate what's at stake um, and what these positions do yeah. and how these positions impact their lives, the kind of effect that it will have having a Secretary of State that does not believe that your vote matters. What does it mean having a school board member that doesn't believe in teaching real American history? What does it mean having a city council member that doesn't believe in real zoning to keep pollutants out of your neighborhood? I mean, so by being really clear about what these positions mean, it begins to open up vistas. And so one of the things that I will, I, I think about is the 2017 special election in Alabama for U.S. Senator between Doug Jones, who was a, the man who took on the Klan in the killing of the four little <coughs> girls in Birmingham, and Judge Roy Moore. Lord have mercy. <laughs> There's just nothing else to say there. And, and, and Alabama had deployed every method of voter suppression against this black population. And so when you looked at the polls, it looked like Judge Roy Moore, despite all of the nastiness that comes behind what he has done, it looked like he was going to win. But you had a series of organizations on the ground, mobilizing, organizing, and one of the first things that they did was they didn't say, folks, you need to vote. They asked the people what they wanted. Mm, what wow. did they envision for their lives? And then in that conversation about what people envisioned for their lives, then they link that up with what voting would mean for being transformative, for being able to get to that point. Um, and you had this massive turn. I remember seeing the election results come through. And Alabama, it was like red, red, Republican, Republican, Republican. And then there was like Huntsville, where it was for the Democrats. And then it was Republican, Republican. <laughs> and then there was this moment. I'm looking at Twitter, and Bernice King, who is Reverend Martin, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's daughter tweeted, Selma, Lord Selma, and Selma, Alabama, boom, turned the tide. And you just saw blue, 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 blue. And then Birmingham, boom, knockout punch. I mean, I, as, I, as I wrote, there weren't enough white evangelical Christians left in Alabama to pull <laughs> Judge Roy Moore off the mat because that was what being able to envision what democracy could mean, and then being able to tap into how do we civically engage to make this democracy real. That's how this works. That's, that's where the hope comes from. The hope is always with the people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
I don't know how to follow that up, but um, uh, no, but just to say, I think over the, the, so your optimism, like I think over the long term, and I don't mean long term in terms of generation, I think it's sooner than that, but you know, in this cycle, I feel our only hope is in the work like of Stacey Abrams and the ground game and mobilizing the people and bringing out the vote. That is the system we have. We don't have any other choices. So over the short term, that's the fight we have to fight and we have to fight it district by district and do our best to preserve democracy, literally, and not let these illiberal forces mm -hmm. who have, I think, fallen into the rabbit hole of conspiracy and really been hoodwinked and easy, easily manipulated by would-be autocrats. I think that's that's the fight we're in for the next little while. Over the longer term, I, I mean, you listen to young people, you see the spirit of entrepreneurship, the courage to reinvent, the conversations we're having today and in the last two days about literally reinventing what a democracy for and by the people need and rebuilding institutions to be something very different than elections. I mean, that's a really courageous conversation that was non-existent three years ago, right? So you see how far we're coming and how fast we're coming. And I think, you know, again, over the long term, I think we've got a phenomenal future ahead of us. I think to get there, I don't think we're gonna have another uncontested election in the United States. Mm -hmm. I see a deepening of the polarization. I see a, you know, increasing tolerance for, for political violence. Mm -hmm. So over the short term, I'm very worried and very mm -hmm. pessimistic. But over the long term, I think we're gonna have an incredible and reinvented democracy. And I think it actually may happen in the United States because of the crisis point we're reaching. And in a way, that would be a good thing for democracy everywhere. If we reinvent it in the United States, I believe it'll spread faster. Let's talk a moment about, uh, you know, we've been focusing on the political process in the United States, both in terms of individuals, charismatic individuals like Trump, as well as structural, mm -hmm. as you were talking about, voter suppression. But let's also now add in the economic, because clearly that has been a big factor um, and inequality, and we were talking, this has been through a lot of the sessions. To what degree has the increasing inequality um, that has been going on over a couple of decades, do you think has fed into this, perhaps in some ways a good way in terms of mobilizing more young people, but also in mobilizing the far right as well? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if any of you have seen the video where there's a, um, a monkey, some sort of monkey in a cage, and he's eating grapes, and then another one is eating grapes the next to them, and then pretty soon the monkey gets a cookie, and this one only gets grapes, and the monkey that only gets grapes begins to go mad and violent. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in some ways that's what we're seeing being played out, and we call it polarization, but it, but it is part of the, it's making us crazy, this inequality. Mm -hmm. But my, my observation about the United States is, and we have this in many places, we have a tale of two cities, or a tale of a city and a dwarf, depending mm -hmm. on where you're from. We have a rural-urban divide. Urban people are not hanging out with rural people, and rural people are not hanging out with urban people, and the Democrats have completely abandoned places where they can't win. And because of that, it's deepened. There's no engagement, no engagement, and no engagement. And I think one of the big challenges is, and I, and I, I want to flip to the opportunity I think we have, is that, the, I don't know how many people understand America, I don't know that we understand America, but one of my mentors, a guy named George Lakoff, who's a cognitive scientist, Berkeley one, he describes America basically as there's two metaphors. There's the strict parent, which party is that? That's the Republican Party. And there's the nurturing, sorry, the strict father, let me be very clear, <laughs> strict father and then the nurturant parent. The strict father, it's very easy to have command and control long game. You just listen to the boss and the boss goes and you do it. The nurturant parent is, you're gonna let the kids make the mistakes, you're gonna have a big table, everyone's gonna listen to one another, and that's what the coalition of the Democrats is. And what's been going on, and I really wanna point this out, we just heard in the New York Times, I think the New York Times broke the story, that in the Women's March that came after the election of Donald Trump, that all of a sudden there was all this scuttlebutt um, rumors or things happening that it's white women that sold out black women and it's transgender people who sold out black people and it's, and all of this like, it's third wave feminism and not second wave and all of a sudden the movement was like, the women's movement was fighting one another and it turned out that it was 350 bots in Russia. So one of the things I wanna tell you all is we are being distracted by, look at the birdie, this is like Norm, Chomp, Norm Chomsky's warning, like we are being divided. And one of the things I think that's really dividing us is every time we talk about how bad trust in government is over and over and over again, 
I wonder how much of this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm not taking away that people feel disconnected, but how much of that disconnection has been fomented by outside forces? We gotta play defense against this misinformation, against even within our own party. So I don't want us to be distracted by really hard sources, because what happened, the women's movement basically fought each other, and now we're coming back together around jobs. Mm -hmm. There wasn't this okay. ruling, now we're coming back together, women are coming out in droves. That's the abortion That's ruling, the abortion, to, it took down to make it the, clear. The, the, the federal protection of mm -hmm. an abortion, which is complicated mm -hmm. in the US, because mm -hmm. we have um, federation. I'm just saying, let, y'all, let's not be distracted by the people who really want to win, and those are the autocrats. Let's not fight amongst ourselves, please. We don't have time. We have to innovate. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think one of the key pieces, we're gonna flow right on that, one of the key pieces with this, this economic divide, this economic inequality, has been uh, uh, the culture piece that says, the reason why you whites in rural areas don't have anything is because we're having to give it all to those minorities, yep. or we're having to give it all to those immigrants. That's why you don't have. And so what gets lost are the economic policies that divert millions, <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars to the top 1% um, that, that create structures that, that, that cr uh, move jobs and uh, economic opportunities and p quality public education out of those spaces. Um, and so you're not, what, what you're not seeing are the policies that create those economic inequalities. Instead, it becomes those people. That divide and conquer piece is, is just, it is so, it is a playbook that continues to win. And so we have to be very cognizant about what it is. And so yes, there is that economic inequality, but why is there that economic inequality? If we start asking that question mm -hmm. and coming back with real answers, then we're going to begin to see something that we saw in the 1890s. I'm a historian. I know we're supposed to be doing the past 10 years, but, <laughs> <laughs> but in the 1890s, part of what we saw was that the economic disparities were so intense and the policies were so intense that were pouring money into the banks, into the big railroads, is that you had poor whites working with poor blacks coming together in a political party that had a vision of what America could be. And it was an America where the resources went to the people, wow. Where there was real public education for all of the children, wow. Where there were opportunities readily available. I mean, they had a vision where voting was not restricted, wow. I mean, they had a vision and then divide and conquer came in and split poor whites from poor blacks, yeah. and you got the rise of Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. we have to be cognizant of that. We have come close to that vision before. But how do we combat that you know, in an, in an atmosphere where not only do you have Russian bots, and you know, there's lots of evidence at this point um, about Russian um, tampering with not only US elections, but also the UK Brexit vote, mm -hmm. and many other things. But when you have, at least in the United States, an institution like Fox News that is basically offering an alternative narrative of the facts. And so, you know, on the one hand, I, I'm sorry, as I'm sure, heck, you can just say they lie. <laughs> <laughs> alternative <laughs> facts, they Alter lie. <laughs> an alternative version of events. But, um, but so I, I guess, I, I guess the question is, and, and you know, this came up last night in the discussion when people are working hard and they don't have a lot of money and how much can we expect them to really be knowledgeable and engage. Um, on the other hand, we, we do have this kind of blaring disinformation machine that's very sophisticated and well-funded. Mm -hmm. So how do we, how do we yeah. go about it? So Dawn, I, mean, I honestly think it doesn't work. That's my honest opinion. My honest opinion is that electoral representative democracy relied very, very heavily on a few controlling the narrative, and that's not the world we live in anymore. Yeah. We live in information chaos, and it's not going back, in, the genie's not going back in the bottle. Mark Zuckerberg is not gonna save our democracy no matter what he does with Facebook platform. <laughs> the tools for manipulation are out there, and they're, they're gonna remain, and those who will use them against us will continue to use them against us and find better and better ways of doing so. 
I truly believe that what we have to do is have the courage to reinvent our institutions in order to create a democracy that can be resilient in this time. And it's not representative electoral democracy. We have to bring it, I th we have to bring and ground the power in the people. We have to bring the people together across these divides because when people sit in rooms together, and uh, even like Republicans and Democrats right now who hate each other, and they spend time understanding each other, and they spend time trying to get to know each other, they often come to much better conclusions than would be reflected in the politics of toxicity and hate and that are, that's sold to us by our political system. People aren't as divided as our politics. So, so what does that look like, though? Well, I think it looks like, you know, citizens' engagement processes, participatory processes, citizens' assemblies. Um, there's all kinds of tools out there now that can bring people together to help them make decisions as communities to solve problems that they share in common. It's being done all over the world, and we could do a lot more of it. And I promise you we'd have better policies as a result of it and less politics. Lisa. Could I just pull us up a level? I, I totally agree. I'm super yeah. excited about the work we're trying to do to get politicians to take on some of these things. I want to take us to the level of I, I was talking to a young man who wanted to start a political leadership incubator in his home state of Argentina, and he said, I don't think we could do it right now because we have narco trades everywhere. So I'm quitting my job, and I'm going to go get a PhD to understand narco trades. And he said, why do people get involved in narco trading? Why do good people start becoming narco trading? Is it the money? Yeah, but really, why is it? It's belonging. They feel a sense of belonging. And I spend time in rural America, a lot of time in RVs. And you talk to people, they have a lot of money. The reason why they are a part of Magna is they feel a sense of belonging. And our modern day capitalist system, I, I'm gonna sound like a radical, it, there's not a lot of place for belonging in America right now. And I just wonder, like, you know, if you looked at different times in our history when we had an en enemy, and I don't want to have an enemy. I mean, I don't want one, but we have one right now, it's clear. There's a war going on. Mm -hmm. And China, we're not like, that's, that's coming too. We need to have politics of belonging, mm -hmm. of all of us. That's where people need to start. The elections are all the manifestation, the citizen assemblies will help, but what happens in the absence of a sense of community? How do we build communities again? I think we need to focus on how our economic structure makes us work three jobs at a time, right? And why are we working three jobs? So we can have another big TV? Is that the sense of belonging, having a bigger TV? And I think America has to tackle some materialism, because frankly, where we're going with climate, unless we change the way we live our lives, technology is not gonna save us. We have to change how we think about the world. And I'm excited for that. We can have a new sense of belonging. I mean, there has been a lot of work done. I, there's this famous book that some of you may have read from years ago called Bowling Alone, yeah. the idea oh, yeah. that, you know, a lot of the institutions or such, you know, not informal ones that brought the sense of community. But again, and not to always be the bring up the negative side, but we've also seen how that sense of community can be our community in keeping people out, whether it's a trade union that doesn't want to let blacks in for the first time, whether it's a religious organization that doesn't want to let immigrants in or whatever. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, we were talking about earlier, the, you know, technology, it's, it's a tool and it can be used for good or for ill. So, you know, how do we direct it better? You know, part of the way that we direct it better is to help folks understand how to assess disinformation how to assess the quality of the information that they're getting, um, how to assess the sources. I mean, we work on, I work on that with my students um, because so much stuff looks real. Like, there was, um, there was a, 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 a meme, not a meme, but a, a, a fake, what do you call it, a fake deep hickey? Fake? Yeah, a, a deep, deep fake, fake. that was yeah. the thing. <laughs> That's the name of it, a deep yeah. fake that was out there on Twitter that had Kirsten Cinema who is the um, Democrat from Arizona, senator mm -hmm. from Arizona, and it had Trump standing next to her, and he's like touching her, and he's like holding her, and, and folks are like, ew! And I said, no, nah, that's not real. Mm. That's not real because you could tell that when he was touching her, she wasn't wincing. <laughs> <laughs> right? um, and it turned out it was a deep fake but this thing had been retweeted over and over and over because folks were like, ew, ew. Um, and, and so it requires us to, to stop in that moment and just because 
you know, there's been so much research done that says that you retweet the things that you already have the kind of affinity for, mm -hmm. that you already mm -hmm. believe is, is happening. So you're like, yeah. Right. We've got, yeah, we've got to pull back and we've got to know that and we've got to, to engage critical thinking. Mm -hmm. I, and, I, and so because part of, you know, this quest for community, that is part of what the social media piece does, mm -hmm. is it helps create a sense of community where there isn't one. And so folks feel a sense of belonging with the, the folks that they're following on Twitter, the folks who are in their Facebook group. Um, and, and that's where a lot of the bad information comes from. So we have to be able to discern what disinformation looks like. What are the patterns? The 2016 election, for instance, we talk about the Russian bots. Um, one of the things that they did in addition to the massive voter suppression that was happening against black folk in the 2016 election is you had the Russian bots coming in, um, working with these Black Lives Matter groups and these social justice movement groups and saying, you know, hey, we're there for you, we're there for you, you know, this is our group, we're, you know, police are like, yeah, and then, but you know, why vote? Show them your power. Show them you don't need them, right? And I mean, and so this was coming in, it was playing on a sense in the black community that the vote didn't matter, that these politicians were going to do what they were going to do anyway. And so playing on that, and so this is also part of what we have to be really cognizant of. So unfortunately, we're out of time, but I think that's a wonderful note to end on, which is just how important democracy and information, clear information and education are. Yeah. Anyway, thank you all so much. We'll see you later tonight. Thank you. Thank you.